so here we are. Um, I uh, we worked on the high price or high cost, high price of love, and uh, that was in the last show. And I thought, and this was just yesterday, so I thought I would come back and continue on with writing this song or composing this song, but I'm not sure because. Um, it's one of those things uh, I was thinking about how when you're composing music um, you sometimes have to let things formulate or sit and, and ferment almost into a, a, a fine wine <laughs> that's all I can think of for fermenting fermenting music no but uh, when you're composing uh, music, it, sometimes you get uh, a lot of information, as we did in the last show. The last show was kind of amazing, I thought, because I was actually doing stuff live that I've never done before. And that was, and I don't know if you could see it, but <laughs> it was like those energies I was talking to or influencers or inspirations entering my imagination while I'm playing and, and actually composing the song. So, and I, and I spoke a little bit about how I do composing music, and um, I think there's a lot of other players that uh, are composers and songwriters that do it in a similar fashion. In fact, I know there's a lot because you can check out um, different documentaries and stuff on I, I noticed there's a lot of documentaries on YouTube that talk about albums on how albums came to be and how the songs on albums came to be. And you'll, you'll see in those documentaries exactly what I'm talking about. I'm, not, I'm no superstar, I just like composing songs. And uh, you know, some of my songs have been recorded by other people um, and, and others are I'm thinking uh, some some more are going to be coming along like that because uh, of what I talked about uh, in regard to the cheese toast, cheese toast song that I composed oh ten years ago and somebody mentioned it on to me on the street um, where I live, which was and it's a pretty big city of two million people, so it's it's kind of unusual that you just run into somebody like that. But anyways. Um, so what's happening with the high price of love is I could work on it today and take it to the next level, but I, I still think I have to let it, let it simmer, let it, let it grow on its own, um, until, uh, I can figure out where I want to take it. So we took it some, we took it pretty far yesterday. And so... But something that I wanted to discuss about songwriting and how to do, uh, how to compose music, um, for me has been, well, I, I've successfully composed lots of songs and I play them for people, oh, uh, weekly, basically now. <laughs> I'm working every Saturday, um, playing music, so, uh. And I like to squeak in my originals into the performance once in a while. It's not the band, uh, it's not my band per se, or it's it's just um, a group of musicians that are doing a job, so um, running a jam. Uh, so what I was, my point I'm trying to make is that when it comes to composing music, it's um, it's a very common thing to have to let songs sit um and i was watching there's there's i should if i knew how to post this in the notes or the description of what i watched yesterday uh you could probably find it on youtube it's basically a couple of members of Def leopard talking about how they composed um the songs for hysteria uh, one of the greatest uh, albums of all time 25 million albums sold? That's a lot for one record. Um, one million sold for, for one record's pretty amazing. So, there's and there's plenty of albums like that, 
by Queen, Pink Floyd, Elvis Presley. The list is endless. How many, how much music has been sold? However, um, the the guys in this band, they never had. They really didn't have other people writing songs for them. They did write, uh, compose some of their songs with others. But what I found very interesting, in um, making reference to that band was that the comp composing process it was almost like working for a business where all the five members of the band would basically contribute to every song on the record and it included the producer for that record a guy named uh, Robert John Lang also known as Mutt Lang he was Robert John Anyways, he was a very, very famous producer. Um, but he contributed a lot to the songwriting for that record, as well as um, other ones. So, but uh, yeah, the, the composing process, what we're doing with the, pr the high price of love, like I said before, it's, it's a neat little phrase. It came to me out of the blue, and we, I just built on it yesterday. And so, uh, and took it probably halfway there, I would say, because the next part to the song would just be composing verses for, to, back, uh, to support the chorus. So anyways, getting back to these uh, other very famous, popular uh, celebrity musicians who are composers, um, have often said that when they collaborate or when they compose something it starts off as, as just an idea but they kind of make sure that the idea is worthy of bringing it to the other com uh, uh, co-writers or other other people in the band so I thought that was kind of unique so they they would actually self-screen whatever they had which I don't know if that's such a great idea. It's 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 one of their methods uh, for the Def Leppard band. Uh, however, I don't think there's such a thing as a bad idea for a song, because it's art. That's like saying, oh, I painted a painting. Oh, I can't show people this painting because there's something wrong with it. It's uh, that could be true in art. Uh, painting as an art form, um, but I think for uh, songs whatever comes to your mind it might be something super silly like cheese toast you know I came up with this funny thing one morning after waking up and and feeling good and uh, what was I having for breakfast cheese toast while listening to I don't know if James Brown was actually playing in the background while I I doubt it, I doubt that was the case, but I had been listening to, I, I had been hearing a lot of James Brown when I composed the song, so it's a it's a very similar uh, feeling to uh, James Brown's music, and I'm a big fan of James Brown as well. Anyways, so the high price of love can can also have. Um, we're, I'm not sure where it's going to be. I think in the last uh, show I did, I was saying how it would be cool to have different people's perspectives on what that means. So I have a feeling what I'd like to do, because it's a composition that for me is very, very new and very um, different from any other ideas I, I can remember coming up with out of thin air. Um, the high price of love might mean something to different people. So I think I'm working again on Saturday, and so I'm playing to about 250 people generally, give or take a few. And uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna talk to people in the crowd about yeah composing this song, and see what they think of that title. And I'm gonna ask them what does this what does this phrase mean to you, or what do you see? And I'm gonna try using that as inspiration to come up with other verses and um, might be friends of mine I don't know who I'm gonna run to I run into a lot of friends or 
or accomplices or uh, <laughs> other musicians that I, I know, uh, colleagues, one might say. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll get their input. Some people are composers that I know. Some people have never come up with their own song ever and they're like 60 or 70, you know. And uh, to me, I find that kind of shocking but it is what it is, you know. Um, everyone's different. So, but I do know some people that I'm going to run this idea past and uh, just see what they think. Because I can remember, um, it just made, made me remind myself of, uh, there was a blues harmonica player named Gary Primich, uh, who I got to be really good friends with back in the 90s. Uh, and uh, he passed away. Um, and Gary was also a song, a composer. At the time I knew him, I really didn't take composing music that serious. Like, if I came up with my own song, yay, uh, I take it very, uh, I don't, I shouldn't say serious, but I, um, uh, yeah, I guess I am taking it more seriously than I did. So rather than just let things go back into the ether when they come into my imagination, I pick up my iPhone or I pick up a recording uh, device or a piece of paper and a pen and scribble it down. And Or usually today, with today's technology, I can record my idea on the, on the, on the uh, whatever uh, audio recorder I've got. So, and they're available, for, you can get them for 20 bucks, they're so inexpensive today, it's crazy. So anyways, Gary and I were at this uh, friend's party, I believe, and uh, we never made anything out of this song, but being in the mu uh, business, the show business end of things I was in, the blues community and the blues and, and uh, I guess, um, I don't know what I don't know what genre I really was. I was just basically an entertainer, and I played blues. I played my own songs, and uh, I played dance kind of grooves. But it was all pretty much blues based, which Gary was too. He was a fabulous, incredible blues harmonica player. I miss him a lot. Um, and he would. Uh, <laughs> we were at this party, and we just came from this bar which was a rough bar and in a rough bar you usually have well back in the day it was uh biker gangs and uh drug dealers like and, and i'm not saying everybody in the bar was that way but you have you know a lot of the darker side of life hanging out in these places and being a musician i knew a lot of them like uh just because of the business they were in and what i did for uh how i spent my time in music Anyways, so um, I just had this crazy line or phrase going through my head, and I said, "Hey, Gary, um, <laughs> we had and we were having a couple of uh, drinks at this party, and I said, "Hey, Gary, I came up with a silly thing." He goes, "He's a biker. He's a biker," and I've been throwing it around with uh, other members of the, the band I was in and we just chuckle about it and he just looks at me he looks up <laughs> I'll never forget he just looks up from his drink and says he's got a girl and he's going to strike her and then we just laughed because it was like a harsh thing to say but the reality of it is is yeah that's the lifestyle a lot of those uh those sort, sort of people lead they don't treat their girlfriends that great some do. I'm not saying they all all do. So, um, anyways, that was a, a a funny collaboration. It went nowhere. It's just something I remember because um, Gary and I clicked. Like whenever we talked about music, blues, whatever, we uh, always were on a, on the same page. And my, a real good friend of mine named uh, Shorty. He called himself Shorty Lenoir. Uh, was playing with uh, Gary at the time, and uh, so we it, we we just hang out, right? Because my pals, right? So and and that's another thing of being a composer in the in the blues community, and this might apply to you as well, because 
if you're just learning songwriting right, right now, the most happy feeling you can get as a composer is when you do talk to a fellow composer or a musician and you say something about something you're working on, it's not like you have to keep it a secret. You're working on it. And um, I know some musicians are really uh, uh, introverted when it comes to their um, uh, compositions and they don't share a lot of, about it until it's a popular thing. I don't think that way anyways. So um, you just, we, uh, we talked about stuff like that. And uh, anyways, the, um, my point I'm trying to make is when you're composing, and you do discuss it with friends or, or musicians, you're going to find people that are going to, they're going to click with you. And when you find those people, hang on to them and, and, and stay in touch with them because those people can also inspire your songwriting. Why? Because they're kind of on the pa same page, especially if they're a composer. So, and th that I think is a very important part of composing music is being able to share it with, uh, I'm not saying share it with complete strangers because that would probably get you nowhere. Uh, but once you, once you start establishing a uh, rapport with other uh, songwriters and musicians, then you'll, 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 you'll get it. You'll, you'll figure out who, who you can actually share stuff with and get some feedback. I'm, I know a lot of people. I know a lot of the fans that I, I, I've met and I have no problem sharing that kind of stuff with them. They might not even be songwriters, but that doesn't mean they're not a creative mind. So, um, it's, it's a real fascinating thing that like, uh, it's hard to put into words, but, um, that's, I think what I'm going to do for the next stage of, um, the high price of love. Cause, uh, it'd be interesting to get more stories. I only have a few of myself for myself, but it'd be nice to, to just hear other people's stories on that subject. So, um, not a real long show today because I really have nothing on my mind other than that and just discussing the, uh, how, there was another point I wanted to make about composing songs and being able to, uh, share your compositions with others. Um, once you're happy with your final composition, whatever your song is, yeah, then you can maybe get a copy written and protect it and all that stuff with uh, publishing and uh, there's a whole bunch that comes along with that. I'm not an uh, expert on publishing, but I have a friend who is. He's recorded several albums. So um, that's pretty much it for today. So I'm going to, I might expand on this on the next show, but just to kind of a short show today. And uh, I'm going to, I'm, I think I'll have some more stuff ready after sa Saturday, but tomorrow I'll probably come up with something new on a Wednesday because they're halfway there. And so thanks for joining me on this. And like usual, if you uh, like what you're hearing and you want to comment or ask me some questions on songwriting, feel free to put something in the comments and I will respond. We'll see you guys next time. Have a great day.